Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Barrett Owen. I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist. We're so glad you've joined us for worship here online. We know things are difficult right now. We know there's so many changes that are happening in the world due to COVID-19. And we're so glad that we can participate in worship with you in the safety and comfort of your own home. We do want you to know that we have started worshiping in person at 9 o'clock for a contemporary service in our sanctuary and at 11 o'clock for a traditional service in our sanctuary. We are meeting over Zoom for Bible studies as well throughout the week or on Sunday mornings. And if you have any questions about how you can get involved or ways in which you and your family can stay connected to a church, please contact us at the church office. Please know also we are praying for you, that we love you, and we understand the value of worship and how we can stay connected to the divine in ways in which they can open up our soul and so we can feel comfort in the midst of chaos. So would you join me this morning as we begin our online worship together in prayer. Everlasting God, this time of worship is for you. We have collectively gathered from all walks of life. We have found ourselves mentally and spiritually present to experience your grace. A lot has brought us to this moment. So help us clear the mind chatter, clear the noise that goes on that is the chaos inside. Help us be still, help us be calm and experience your grace anew. This time of worship is for you. Amen. Today, we're going to talk about something else that, that I love, stories. There's lots of stories out there, and people love stories, whether somebody tells you a story like a bedtime story, or you read a story like in a book, or it's a story that they put into a movie. People listen to stories. They, they understand things 
when they hear a story. And there might be a story about people, like this book is about Jesus. It's about his life. It might be a story that teaches us something, even when it's almost like a riddle when you read it. This is one of my favorite books. It's not really a happy story, but it's a great story. And if you haven't read it, I think you should. It's about a tree and a boy. And the tree gives everything, his apples, the wood, everything to this boy. And the boy keeps taking things from this tree, but the tree doesn't mind. I guess. And soon that boy is not a boy anymore. And the tree keeps giving until the tree is nothing but a stump. Hmm. Do you think the tree minded giving everything to the boy? I'm not sure. But the reason this is a great book, it makes us think. It makes us wonder, hmm, that tree could be like a parent who gives love, who's patient, who gives you a chance after chance. Maybe that's what it's about. I don't know, but it makes us think. Jesus told stories too. And in the Bible, there's lots of stories that Jesus told. And some of the stories remind me of the giving tree because there's a story inside the story that you think they're telling and it's called a parable. So for the next few weeks we're going to be learning about stories called parables that when Jesus told them it sounded like a nice story but there was always a little bit more to it and when you're ready to learn about the kingdom of God those parables suddenly made more sense. You learned more about God, about God's world, about our life by listening and learning to these parables. So today, we're going to start learning about the parables that Jesus told people. And today, start listening, not just to the story when you hear it, but start listening with your heart. And I wonder if you're going to figure out some other things that the story might be telling us. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. This is the parable of the wicked tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out on the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. 
This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
Jesus teaches in parables. We know this. We've worked through parables together over the years, and we know that they seem simple, but they're anything but. They use normal, everyday vernacular, but bury within itself a twist, a punchline. Oftentimes, the deeper you think about the parable, the deeper the meanings go. And please, please hear me say this, and then test it out for yourself. There is never just one meaning to parables. There are always many. We're going to jump into a parable today, but a quick word about just biblical studies in general. When we read the Bible, we try to pull truth and understanding from the pages. This is called exegesis, and this is a good thing. When we study Scripture, we remove something of substance and we examine it for our lives. For the longest time, we thought this was all biblical studies was, but over the last hundred years, scholarship has really written extensively about eisegesis. This is the opposite of exegesis. Instead of what you take out of the text, eisegesis is about what we bring with us as we enter. It's the paying attention to our own souls and selves, our own internal dialogues and worldviews as we enter the text. There is never a time when we don't bring something with us into Scripture. And the best scholarship happens when we hold our eisegesis while examining our exegesis. And this is why we say there's more than one meaning to parables. Which says a second thing that I want to name up front. Exegesis and eisegesis. It just shows how incredibly sophisticated and good and present the Holy Spirit is. No matter what we bring with us or what we've been through or what we take out, the Spirit comes to us through the pages of Scripture and breathes life into us. The Bible is a living document. When we excavate it, we aren't looking at dry bones, but rather we're feeling the full breath of its life. So there you go. I could talk about this kind of stuff for hours, but I want to jump into this parable together. Our parable today is called the parable of the wicked tenants. It's the second parable Jesus tells to the chief priest and the elders who approach him angrily and impassioned for the spectacle that he was creating in Jerusalem. Now remember, Jesus has just entered Jerusalem moments ago. He paraded in on a donkey, marched to the temple. This is all like Palm Sunday stuff. He turned over the money changers' tables. He cursed a fig tree. He's teaching about being the Son of God while ridiculing the ruling elite. Now, the chief priest and his temple elders approach Jesus, demanding to know by what authority Jesus thinks he can just come in and do what it is he's doing. And this is the second parable Jesus tells him, or tells them, and it's a doozy. So listen as I read God's Word. Verse 33, listen to another parable, says Jesus. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. All right, so this is the setting. It's ordinary. We have a landowner, a vineyard, tenants working the land. The most obvious interpretation here is that God's the landowner, and He has put humans in charge to make something of this vineyard of earth. But instead of working for the landowner, we committed treason, or the humans did. The humans sinned. They turned the prophets around for themselves. Another way to read this text, and this is just a great example of eisegesis. Think about climate change. The world is like the vineyard and was left to us by God to manage. I mean, Genesis says humans are the caretakers over the earth. We have dominion. The human experience, though, 
in all of its wickedness, has taken over the production of the vineyard and is no longer taking its cues from the divine, the landowner. And this parable is an indictment on the broken covenant of humans caring for God's earth. Now, this is just an example of another way to read this text. There are so many more. I bet you could have 10 more you could think of. When we take Scripture seriously, it does the same thing back on us. It takes us seriously. Now back to the story. Verse 34. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. All right, all of a sudden, there's an allegory for life here. God created the world and everything in it, left earth but put us in charge, occasionally sending servants to speak on behalf of God, prophets, if you will, but humanity turned its back on God and killed those who were sent. Jesus is indicting those who say they're the keeper of the vineyards. He's indicting the chief priest and the elders. And all of those people who claim dominion over the vineyard, Jesus is saying they are the wicked ones. And this gets better, or worse, depending on how you read this. Verse 37, Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Here's something that's nicely buried deep into this parable. The chief priest doesn't know it yet, but Jesus is predicting his own death. I mean, this is genius. Jesus says it right in front of them, and they totally miss it. Verse 40, Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. And then verse 42, And Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people that produces the fruit of the kingdom. The one who fails on this stone will be broken to pieces falls on the stone, and will crush anyone on whom it falls. Verse 43 pretty much says all we need to know about the divisive nature of Jesus' teachings in Jerusalem. He says to the chief priests and elders in the temple, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and then given to the people that produces the fruits of the kingdom? I know this is hard to hear. It's difficult language. It brings up such judgment and retribution on behalf of God and God's humans. But speaking of eisegesis, there's an old Jewish way of thinking on how to understand political disaster when you reject God. The Jews made a philosophical connection that destruction comes when we reject the divine. Examples of this are in apocryphal books like 2 Ezra or 2 Baruch. I mean, Matthew's writing these stories down for Israel to read, and they have just been defeated, demolished by Rome. And he's using the same connections that ancient Israel did when they were destroyed and they were overthrown by the Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and now Romans. Matthew is saying that priests and elders are going to lose the vineyard due to their rejection of God's Son. So the enemy is not an outside force attacking. The enemy is us. It's from within. It's from the people on the vineyard. Now, we can't not see this here. But before you rush to interpreting this parable as redemptive violence only, let me add that this idea of destruction was a philosophical idea by the Jews, and it was meant to be eschatological meaning that 
it would talk about the end of the world or how the world was going to end. It was never meant to be a Christian ethic. To think God hurts those who reject God is just another clear example of eisegesis. It's what makes us think that God does what God, we want God to do to the people we don't like. This is why we need to excavate Scripture exegetically and eisegetically. So yeah, I know all this is weighty. It's a lot. So what do we take away from all of this today? There's one detail I can't help shake, and I'll leave you with this. The landowner. He sends servants to collect, but they're killed. So he sends more. They're killed. So he sends his son. He's killed. So then he comes himself. There's a relentlessness to the landowner that I can't shake. And I'm wondering if this is not what the Spirit is telling all of us today. The landowner relentlessly pursues the vineyard and the wicked tenants. Who would keep sending servant after servant when one after the other would come back bruised and broken or even not at all? Who would do that? Only someone with an unquenchable hope and almost unthinkable mercy. Perhaps this parable opens up our eyes to God. No doubt the priest and the elders are the wicked tenants, but perhaps we are too. Yet God and all of God's mystery keeps coming to us no matter what, pursuing us and the good that can come from the vineyard. So as you think about this parable this week, make sure to hold what New Testament scholar Barbara Reed says. Surely judgment will come to us one day. But mercy hopes beyond hope for change. God's mercy shows up every time with the hope that we have changed. God's mercy shows up every time hoping that we are the ones who are willing to change. This is the question for us. In what ways do we need to become better tenants? Mm -hmm.